911, what are you reporting? Uh, I got a strange going on out here. Something just killed my dog. Something killed your dog? My dog went flying through the air over the tree. I don't know how it did it. Okay. Damn it, I'm really confused. All I saw was my dog coming over the fence, and he was dead when she hit the ground. I didn't see any cars. All I saw was my dog coming over the fence. What are you reporting? Uh, we got someone or something crawling around out here. Did you see what it was? It was. It was standing up. I'm out here looking through the window now and I don't see anything. I don't want to go outside. Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? See ya! Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. All right, folks, I want to welcome our guest to the show. It is DJ from Calling All Beings. Welcome to the show, DJ. Yeah! I'm going to give you the same greeting as when I came on. How you doing, Brian? I'm good, man. I'm good. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while. So let's get right into it. Let's talk a yes, little bit about your background. Talk about you, get the audience familiar with you, and then we'll move into some of this UFO and Bigfoot stuff. And by the way, I emailed Brian about UFOs. I wasn't <laughs> expecting to be invited on. I just wanted to clear up some things, but I am happy and honored to be invited on. Uh, so yeah, my name is DJ, uh, retired U.S. Air Force uh, flight engineer, private pilot, uh, and as a flight engineer, you kind of like, uh, I flew tactical aircraft and, and AC-130 gunships for my last tour. Uh, and you kind of sit in between the two pilots and it's a five person flight deck with a navigator and an electronic warfare officer, two pilots, flight engineer. So, um, got a lot of hours doing that and getting to understand aviation. This kind of helped me when it came to UFOs, uh, work for the air force now as a civilian in uh, flight simulation. It's amazing. I love uh, working for the airmen every day. And, um, you know, uh, th that's basically my career. That's kind of like when I view UFOs and hear first person accounts of UFOs from either pilots or even laypersons, I, I start to build a picture based on what they said. And I apply that to aeronautics to see if this is something anomalous or not. Well, I know you sent an email and there's some things we're going to get into with the Tic Tac UFO and that whole thing. But before we get there, I know you mentioned that you had an experience of your own out in the Hudson Valley. Can you tell us a little bit about what that experience was and, and what happened to you? Yeah. So those that are familiar with UFOs will know that the uh, architect of Project Blue Book, Dr. J. Allen Hynek, wrote a book called Hudson Valley UFOs. Uh, my new friend of a couple of years ago, Linda Zimmerman, has written, I think, four books on Hudson Valley UFOs. Um, and there was a big flap in the 1980s. And when uh, my family and I were transitioning from uh, New York, I was getting ready to move to Florida and sort of had a last night on our, our ranch up there in the Hudson Valley near Peekskill. It was called Peekskill Ranch. Uh, I was kind of seeing the property for the last time. And walking up the hill, I saw something rise above the tree line that was extremely bright. And for a second there, you're thinking like you're looking at like a Close Encounters movie, except you're not. It's sort of like a September morning, uh, excuse me, a September night. And there's not a lot of air traffic in the Hudson Valley and and most certainly not in the 1980s. And we're talking about... 1982, I think it would have been 81 or 82, right after freshman year, just the beginning of sophomore year of, of high school. And I graduated in 85. So um, in seeing that, I you're, you're having that oh bleep moment uh, when you see it. I had another young man with me and we were both seeing the, our this property, the ranch for what I thought was going to be the last time. And it rises above the tree line and floats the other direction. What I was deprived of, and so you're like, holy blank, this is, this is, that's a, a UFO. I mean, that, that's, it's completely silent. 
And what I was deprived of was seeing the shape of it, being underneath it, or being able to see it at an angle where I could discern more about it. But I saw it silently float away over towards the sort of Yorktown Heights, Mohegan Lake, Mayapak area. Uh, and then a lot of people saw it out on Route 84 between New York and Connecticut. That was the totality of the sighting. And I didn't talk about it for probably, you know, 35 to 40 years. Yeah, I had a sighting. If you've listened to the show, you've heard me talk about it on the show plenty of times. So I'm not going to go into detail about it. But when I was 16 with my mom, I saw a, a large craft from six or 800 feet away, no huh. lights. And it was really, really weird, right? So, and it, it definitely wasn't regular aircraft. I don't think it was something that would normally be flying around the remote North Georgia mountains. There was no aircraft supposed to be in that area and certainly not flying that low. But I've always had an interest in UFOs. And obviously everybody sees the tons and tons of UFO stuff that's out there. I think a lot of it is fake. I think the CGI has gotten so much better over the last couple of decades and people are faking a whole bunch of evidence. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of stuff out there that really makes you scratch your head. And one of the things that comes to mind is something we've talked about on the show plenty of times before is the Tic Tac sighting that the military, they, you know, they release these videos of these fighter pilots and they're chasing something that's Tic Tac shaped. And it's a really interesting and compelling video, right? It's certainly not faked. It's certainly not CGI. And I had Leon Thompson on the show. We were talking Bigfoot and somehow we ended up like all rabbit holes. We ended up going down something to do with UFOs. And we were talking about this Tic Tac UFO. And I know that he had some pretty interesting theories on what this was. He believed that it was regular American tech. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the things you mentioned in the email. So can mm -hmm. you talk for maybe people who aren't familiar with the Tic Tac UFO side? I mean, can you talk a little bit about that scenario, what that was and what we're talking about, and then get into mm -hmm. some of your analysis of the video and some of the things that you disagree with Leon on? Well, I, I called a, I actually called a British Intel analyst before this to talk about that incident because he has worked for both the British and the American, uh, Americans, uh, people will know him as Frank Milburn, F A R A N C. And, uh, and we discussed this and I just said, I want to get a sanity check with you because, and he and I have talked about this before, but I wanted to get a sanity check because I've been saying this for quite a while. And the reason what a lot of people don't understand is that when you don't understand aeronautics and you don't understand, and this is going to sound like I'm being demeaning to somebody that's a lay person and I'm not, it would be like asking me about police work and we could fill volumes, novels about what I don't know about police work that you know, uh, because I'm a lay person. Okay. But you went to an academy and you had 13 years on the job or 16 years on the job. So yeah. So he's nodding his head. <laughs> so, um, so creating flight is so difficult. There is a Bernou or Bernoulli's theorem that comes into play. That means we create a wing form that looks like a teardrop. For those of you that you can see my hand, the fat part of my hand is what's flying through the air. And the, the narrow part is the back of the wing. We've all seen that. And what happens is, is when you make the bottom of the wing flat, or concave, which they are when they put the flaps down, and then you arc the top of the wing, what happens is when the air molecules hit that, the air molecules going over the top and the air molecules going underneath want to meet at the back of the wing. And in order for the air molecules going over the top of the wing to do that, they have to accelerate or because they have a greater distance to travel to meet their friends at the aft edge of the wing, the trailing edge. Does that make sense? So Bernoulli's theorem says that when velocity increases, pressure decreases. So when you move those wings through the air, that is how you create lift. A lot of people think of the engines as the engines are what makes the airplane go up. Not really. Yes, an F-22 can climb straight up and then you don't need air, any aerodynamics. It, you just need to steer it with your rudders and your ailerons and your elevator. Right. Okay, I get that. But for a Cessna 172, what makes that fly? The engine is just pulling that wing form through the air, and that creates lift. Um, it's the same theory we used that the Wright brothers used in, in uh, 1901, 
three, I think it was. And it's the exact same principle that every single aircraft we know about to the stealth fighter and the F-22 and the F-35 fly with today. And although I have heard things and Frank, Frank uh, Milburn, who uh, the aforementioned has heard about certain tech, they're working in a lab. They certainly were, I do not believe. And I, if I, if you put somebody in front of me that said to me, do you think the Tic Tac was human, not even U.S., but let's say human-made tech or it was a tech from another intelligence? I'd say what I just said to you. I bet my life against somebody that that, is not, that was not human tech. Now, why would I say that? Why am I so sure about that? Well, first of all, it doesn't follow any of the laws of aeronautics and, and uh, Newton's three laws of motion. It doesn't follow Bernoulli's theorem. It doesn't need to. It can go up, down, left, right, instantaneously, and we can't do that. Certainly, we have a uh, Dragon th uh, 3 rocket and an Apollo series rockets that can reach 17,000 miles an hour, but not like that. We've seen how long it takes to to, to execute and get to that, that sort of uh, velocity, right? So back in the 40s and 50s, when we didn't have a candy called Tic Tac, but pilots and or laypersons on the ground, sometimes law enforcement officers, said, I saw a flying butane tank. Brian, do you remember those natural gas tanks where in the middle it would have that little that little spiel on top of it, and that's where you would hook up the gas? But 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 basically, if you took that off, you had something that looked like a what a Tic Tac looks like or a capsule. Um so uh so was, does that mean that we had that technology back in the 40s and 50s? Lou Elizondo has said that. They're reporting the exact same shape flying through the air silently. So that's how I know. That's one reason. Th th these are two reasons. We talked about the aeronautical part and, and how it doesn't obey any of the laws that we have to obey in order to fly. The most state-of-the-art aircraft, if we want to roll, we have to have ailerons to roll. We have to have a rudder to yaw, this Y axis, and this Z axis. We have an elevator on the back of the tail that makes it go up and down. You know, certainly the stealth bomber has ailerons. It doesn't have a rudder, but basically you have a bomber, so all it needs to do is roll. That's how it makes its turns. It doesn't have a rudder per se. So those are, those are some of the reasons. Let's give you some other reasons. I was a military planner. Uh, at two assignments that I had, uh, one in uh, in England and one here in New Mexico. So what people who say that this is U.S. tech want me to believe is that another government agency, a black agency, whatever you want to call it, said, what we're going to do is we're going to take this Tic Tac, we're going to send it out next to this carrier strike group that we know is training up for a deployment overseas. That's what they're doing off the coast of Southern California right now. They're training for their over, uh, overseas deployment. And for several days, Kevin Day saw those sorties going up to 80,000 feet, coming back down to the, uh, to, to the surface of the ocean. You know, I don't know of any, I mean, Elon Musk just, just launched a rocket that looks very, very similar to the Apollo 11 rocket. And he has more money than God. And we're supposed to believe that the U.S. government has this tech where it can just zip from, Kevin Day said he clocked it at one point going from 28,000 feet to 50 feet with the Spy-1 radar on the Aegis cruiser at 0.79 of a second. So people want me to believe that is human-made tech that can do that, but yet we're still flying around prop aircraft. So there's so that that's that's another aspect of it. Here's the third aspect. So if I'm a direct, if I am a mission planner somewhere, I'm a mission planner. I've got this tech going at at Area 51 or something, and it's a test program, and I've got this this tic tac, and I'm a director of operations, and I'm going to sign some flight orders that is going to send this piece of tech, either manned or unmanned, because manned it moved so fast from zero velocity to past Dave Fravor's windscreen. If there was a human in there. It would have looked like you threw a pepperoni pizza against the wall. And by the way, Brian, a pepperoni pizza with a lot of sauce. Just want to say that. Okay. Because we don't like pizza that doesn't have sauce. Do you? I mean, I don't. That's cheese bread. Okay. He's nodding. Okay. 
He's with me. Okay. So, so we know that it had to be unmanned uh, from that standpoint. So if I'm a director of operations, I'm at, at uh, let's say, Dev 3 U.S. Air Force, Groom Lake, Nevada, and I'm going to send this piece of tech either, let's say it's unmanned, but it's being flown remotely out into this area of operations that I know that this uh, 11th Fleet and the carrier group, strike group there, is training in Southern California. And we're going to mess with, this, with these Navy guys. They're out there flying. We're going to surprise them, right? And we're going to show up in their area. We think eventually they'll direct an intercept, which is exactly what Kevin Day did. He's like, hey, boss, I'm seeing this after several days. I want to direct. It's daytime. It's visual uh, meteorological conditions, which means I can see. So I'm not sending them out into the clouds to intercept the craft that they may or may not be able to acquire visually. You wouldn't want to do that. But you would do it if it's, hey, it's day VMC. This thing's floating around over the ocean. So he sends two FA-18s out there, a rookie pilot, Alex Dietrich, and the brand new Air Wing Commander, first ever deployment, youngest Air Wing Commander in the United States Navy, Dave Fravor. And they intercept on this, and they had no armaments above it, or Dave might have taken a shot at it. I mean, he is a cowboy. I mean, he is, a, he is an aviation badass. I, I said to Frank, he's like the Charles Bronson of aviators, this guy. Um. <laughs> right. And so what does he do as they're in that, uh, pardon the expression, Mexican standoff where they're circling around one another because he dove down on it from about 15 or 15, five, it came up, they end up co altitude and they're in a circle now and it's not concentric. They're just in a circle. And then Dave decides he's going to roll wings to 75 degrees or whatever and point the nose of his aircraft at that object. That's when the object went, Zip, zips right by his windscreen, ends up at the cow point 59 miles away in a couple of seconds. And I think they clocked at it maybe 17,000 miles an hour as it popped up on their radar at the cow point. So somebody wants me to believe that a director of operations somewhere at some test wing directed their aircraft into maybe a Class A encounter, which would have been Dave Fravor hitting that object with his F-A-18 fighter. And now I'd say to the Navy, hey, <laughs> sorry, U.S. Navy, we would have told you about this, but, you know, we just wanted to run a test. It, it's really harmless, I, I promise you. We didn't know this was going to happen. That's not how things are done. How things are done is that you do book a test range at a place like Groom Lake, right, Area 51, or Dugway in Utah, or China Lake in California, or other ranges that I might not even be aware of. And you do book a test range like that, and you get aviators that have TSSCI clearances. You bring them into that their a wing, you know, a couple of aircraft, some maintainers, some aviators. You bed them down, and then you go and you run your test cards against your secret aircraft. You don't just show up in somebody's training area and hey, we'll just see what happens. Hopefully, nothing bad happens. That's not how it's done, and nobody would do that. Nobody would sign off on that within the U.S. government. Absolutely not. I think I'm kind of right there with you because none of that ever made sense to me, right? Yeah. Is you've got these aviators out there. Why would somebody send some tech that's unknown? Because they clearly didn't know what was going on and run the risk of having some big incident like that and somebody possibly getting hurt or killed even. It just didn't really hold water for me either. Let's let's talk a little bit about all these sightings that people have. I've had a sighting. You've had some a sighting of something you can't explain in the skies. People are having these types of experiences all the time. I have people who send me things literally daily. There's one of the former guests on the show, Glenn, who's been on the show out in Kentucky. Glenn photographs and records video of a UFO, a triangle-shaped UFO that visits his house often, almost nightly. He's filming this and sending me videos of it and, and still photographs. And I, I don't know what to make of it. But you have people who constantly have these kinds of encounters. So let me ask you as your professional experience in the Air Force and looking into UFOs just in general, how much of what people are seeing do you think is some sort of man-made tech, whether it be ours, whether it be somebody else who might be even spying on us, 
What do you think about that just in general? Because that's usually the go-to thing. Oh, well, you saw a weather balloon or you saw some kind of anomaly or, you know, we go back to the Project Blue Book days, everything swamp gas back then, right? <laughs> so in your opinion, how much of what do you think people are seeing may be U.S. tech that they're attributing some sort of extraterrestrial something to it? What, what, what do you think about that? Well, one thing I would say is everybody should go back and listen to that audio of Gerald Ford uh, in front of that commission. And, and he was incredulous about the swamp gas because he was very confident in the his constituents and how many there were and of different backgrounds and some of them very uh, uh, trained observers, as, as they say in the community. Uh, that saw that and it, it just uh, doesn't didn't didn't jibe with what he was being told. Um, so what I would say is this, Brian, you have to know if you're seeing a craft, you have to know what you're looking for. So are there things that can float that are dirigible and that probably were some of these balloons that we've seen flying over and so forth? Yeah, that's a dirigible technology. The other two were uncertain. They could have been dirigible based on what we've heard, but we don't know because we don't have we didn't put eyeballs on those. So if I have something that's that's coming close to my house and it's there, so the first thing you want to do is is use your senses. So the first thing we did is we looked at it and we see it, right? Then we got our earlobes. Do I hear a sound? You didn't hear a sound. I didn't hear a sound during our sightings, right? So now I have two things. Now, how is this craft moving? Is it moving about freely? Can it, is it is it look moving in an uncharacteristic manner that's not consistent with any sort of an aircraft or dirigibles? They don't just take off. You know, they can't just leave the scene of something unless there's some sort of a, a propulsion system that's pushing that forward. So if I had a FLIR and IR, a lot of big footers have these. Can I can I see it? Can I see a source of propulsion? The Tic Tac had none had no source of propulsion they could see, no IR energy coming off where we would see an engine. They also had a jamming capability that when uh, they, they try to paint it with that radar, it began to jam radar. And as, as uh, we, I spoke about earlier with one of my colleagues, it didn't upset the avionics or the uh, that, that you need to steer the aircraft, the instruments, but it did prevent them from acquiring it and being able to lock onto it and fire a missile. So. As somebody from the ground, you know, these are things. If you're a big footer, do you have a thermal? Do you have a FLIR? Can you look at it? Do you see any IR energy? I don't I don't hear anything. I I don't see anything coming out of it. And is it moving in a manner that's not consistent with a balloon? Now I can start to build a picture. Does it just zip off and just all of a sudden go from standing to it's gone? Does it rise up? You know, I'm gonna send you a video later, Brian, that I got from a guy in our community named Dan Warren from uh, Tennessee, who I absolutely love. He has a a uh, the fifth pillar of emphasis on TikTok. I recommend anybody who wants to get news and information. Um, he breaks things down. Uh, he's an engineer from Tennessee, uh, very good old boyish looking, which is what I love about him. He looks like he rolled out from under a 65 Comet, but boy... He did. He came on and talked about ancient structures with us for an hour and a half and my head spun around. He's so brilliant on that. And uh, anyway, um, so um, I'm sorry, I totally lost my train of thought. But as you're as you're as you're looking at these things, those are the the observables that you're looking for. Does it and then uh, oh, the video he sent me, I'm going to send you. OK, so this is something that I found interesting. A guy's driving in a car. And I'll share it with Brian, and Brian can share it with the audience. He can put it in the show notes. And he sees a lighted object coming towards his car. So you can see the interior of the vehicle, right? He gets scared as it gets close. So he stops the car, he exits the car, and he walks backwards with his phone. This video is from 2013. It's not recent, right? This gentleman only has two videos online. You see this craft approach the vehicle. And when it bathes the vehicle in light, it doesn't really bathe it in light from a standpoint that the entire vehicle is not lit up, Brian, and there is no point of origin beneath the craft that the light emanates from. So the light emanates from somewhere beneath the craft and go and, and begins to bathe a portion of his car, which you're seeing the tail lights, you're seeing the back of the car, you don't see the side of the car, the front of the car. And there is green material, 
green particulate matter floating within this light. I've never seen a light like this in my life because the only lights we know how to make, you turn it on, it emanates from a source and it, and it, it uh, corrals something, you know, as wide as that beam is, and it just lights it up. This did not look like that. And it looked to be like scanning the car, then the beam went away, and then the craft moved up, and then the craft was gone. I, I get that. I'm speechless when I see that, and I will, I will send that to you after the show. I'll definitely post it on all the social media and I'll have a link to it in the show notes so you guys can check it out. One of the things that comes up with, I'll, I'll use Glenn for an example. You mentioned IR and some other things with FLIR and Bigfooters and having some of that stuff. One of the things that Glenn has done is purchased a couple of these uh, night vision goggles. And he can go out and there's certain times when he can find craft in the sky with these goggles on. When you take them off, it's not visible to the naked eye. And these craft are around his house on a regular basis. And I, I really don't know what to make of that. And it's one of those situations where I've had so many conversations with people who have had encounters with UFOs multiple times. I had Travis on the show recently who had had, and he actually literally sent us a video last night of another UFO that he encountered just yesterday. And these people are having these multiple encounters. And one of the things that I ask him and I've asked Glenn is, why do you think it is with you that you've had these multiple encounters? And almost immediately, both of them said, well, I'm usually looking up. Most people aren't paying attention, right? So when you got those situations, and for me, I'm one of those people that are constantly, if I'm not driving and I'm having the luxury of riding around with somebody in a car or whatever, I'm out here on the property, I'm always looking up in the sky to see if I can see anything, just whatever. I'm flying on a plane. I had to fly out and do a television show this past weekend. And I'm always the one on the window seat looking out the window to see if I can see anything strange. Right. But then you get into some of these more out there experiences. And I want to talk a little bit about that before we move on to some other stuff. I had Daryl Sims on just recently mm -hmm. and Daryl is the alien hunter, right? He's been investigating mm -hmm. aliens and UFO abductions and alien implants for almost 50 years now. Mm -hmm. And Daryl has some really out there encounters of his own. He's mm -hmm. claims to be abducted on multiple occasions. Mm -hmm. We got into cattle mutilations and people being mutilated by possible extraterrestrials. Mm -hmm. And then these alien implants. Do you think, because I, I have certain opinions on this, but I think when you start getting into some of those weirder kind of stories, it tends to pull people in a different direction when it comes to UFOs. So I don't know if you've had any of that kind of stuff on, on your show yes, or had yes. conversations with people about that. What do you think that does for the UFO conversation in general? Because I know what it does when I post those shows and my listeners send me emails and say, that dude was absolutely 100% full of shit. That's a crazy That's story. There's no way that can happen. But what say you, what do you think that does for the UFO conversation in general? Well, let's talk about that for a second. And first of all, I want to applaud Brian for doing UFOs, Bigfoot and paranormal, because there's just too much to talk about to just stick to one topic. So let me, I want to applaud you on that, Brian. Um, so let, let's talk about that for a second. Um, if I would have asked you seven years ago, Hey, um, there's actually UFOs and they're messing with our pilots and we're going to have 31 out of 130 pages of the uh, 2023 NDAA dedicated to UFO study. You would have said, <laughs> Dave, have another drink, uh, DJ. Good talking to you. What's what's happening now? Yep. 31 pages, uh, including. And if I would have said, yeah, there's going to be a public disclosure of an all uh, domain resolution office, uh, all anomalous, uh, domain resolution office, I think is the arrow office, something like that or whatever. So, um, you would have said, yeah, I don't think so. Because before that it was secret that we had a UFO office, right? They said that died with project blue book in when it died in 69. Well, it wasn't dead. There was Lou Elizondo said, Hey, I was the director of a tip. People were like, yeah, right. Okay. So, so the answer is, I don't think it does anything for the conversation. I think uh, that, it, that that's bad. I think we all just need to open our mind that we don't know everything. Um, we don't know everything about Bigfoot. Do we know that it's 
uh, in, in, in our mind that this is absolutely a flesh and blood animal. People have smelled, seen, heard, uh, been touched by uh, as Terry Wendell in his tent or as Rick Taylor saw in the forest. Sure. Does that mean that there's an, another element to it that we don't know? What I take, it, try to tell people in the UFO community, I'm going to say this to the Bigfoot community as well. It doesn't have to be this or that. It can be this and that because we don't know. And this is the case with UFOs. You talk to Whitley Straber. I went and attended a symposium in New York in December. He wrote the famous book Communion. There was a movie made by that where Christopher Walken played Whitley Strieber. Is that a big enough actor for you? Um, he showed an office visit to a doctor wanting to remove a, a piece from his ear, one of these tracking devices, right? And you see him in the office. You can see Whitley. You can see the doctor. You can see them cutting into his ear. He said, I went to grab it with the tweezers and it moved. He started to bleeding. You know, he obviously injected this guy's ear with painkiller. And as he's trying to grab it, it's moving deeper. So uh, do people think he's lying? Your, your fellow North Carolinian, uh, Christopher... Um, Christopher Bledsoe, you're familiar with him? Yeah? Chris Bledsoe? I, I am not, actually. Oh, we're going to have to have, you and I are going to have to have a whole conversation on Chris Bledsoe. Uh, you also have a fellow, fellow North Carolinian named Dr. Diana Pasolka at uh, UNC Charlotte, who went and investigated him for her book, American Cosmic, uh, and also brought uh, noted people like Jacques Vallée. And uh, there's another person whose name, Dr. Gary Nolan, from Stanford University, the um, I believe he's an immunologist at uh, Dr. Gary Nolan, but he's he's our, he's the Jeff Meldrum of the big of the UFO world. If you're not familiar with him, he's Jeff Meldrum in the UFO world. Dr. Gary Nolan of Stanford. Okay, um, and they went to this man's property and found out that every three letter agency had been there. So you're familiar with Jim Semivan from. Um, uh, Lou's former organization with Tom DeLong. Oh, man, I'm going to try to think of what it's called now. Um, to the Stars Academy. So Jim Semivan, if you're not familiar with him, is a retired CIA operative. We've had a couple CIA guys on. John Ramirez was an analyst for the CIA, um, and he's an experiencer. And Jim Semivan was uh, an operative of the CRA, CIA uh, for 25 years and prior U.S. Navy. Jim Semivan went to that property as well and said, when I was on his property, he spoke of the lady in white, the lady that cured him, uh, this angelic-looking figure. Uh, Jim Semivan told us, and you can listen to this episode, he said, I saw a materialized before my eyes a bull that was in white and this white lady figure that he described. So can I say to that guy, you're lying when I know that all these three letter agencies had been there. I know that Dr. Pasolko went there uh, and and for, for her book and all these other people went there. So people are going to go, ah, it sounds like BS, man. I was like, yeah, it may sound like BS because we, I don't know. It doesn't happen to me. It doesn't happen to Brian, but that doesn't mean it's BS. And because you haven't seen it, that's it. Just, you have to open your mind that there are things out there that we don't know because a lot of the people, Brian, I want. I have not seen a Bigfoot. I have not seen God. I 100% believe, uh, believe in God, and I believe that there is this creature called Bigfoot that that is roaming around the forests of 49 reported states. Um, you don't have to see it to believe it uh, that, that 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 this exists. I don't believe in Bigfoot because then it makes it sound like a deity. I believe that it exists, and people have seen it because the 10,000 BFO reports. The 400 or 500 reports you have, the 900 reports Wes has, the 500 reports that Vic Cundiff has, I don't believe all those people are lying. I'm sorry. I definitely agree with you, man. And before we, I want to get into some Bigfoot stuff, but before we go in there, sure. you, met, you mentioned Lou Alex, you Elizondo. mentioned Lou Elizondo a couple of times. I want to talk a little bit about the conversations you had with him and mm -hmm. Did he really share anything that was enlightening to you about the UFO community or the UFO phenomena in general that really stuck out to you during the times that you, you got to talk to him? 
he has said something, and I'm going to paraphrase now, and I would have actually prepped for this particular question if I would have known, but he said something to the community, uh, not necessarily to me personally, and realized he had done hundreds of interviews before he came on our show. So the idea was to make it fun, to take him on some different roads he hadn't been on, not to get him to retread information he said on everyone else's show. Uh, and most exper people's experiences come on that come on cab find that it's not like other shows. You'll probably you're also going to find that out when you come on. Um, it's 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 funny and it's fun and we kind of do a sine wave of a little bit comedic and serious and comedic and serious. Lou has said that. What if everything that you learned growing up that your parents told you, that your clergy told you, that your um, teachers told you wasn't true? What if the, what you were told about the world and, and its, its context and our place within it is not actually the way it is and that maybe... Um, he said maybe DNA had been manipulated at some point. Um, there are people who have various theories about that. Dr. Michael Masters has a theory about uh, a lot of the intelligences we see that are these gray aliens or the future us. Less hair, you know, different, different needs, uh, less uh, sex organs. You know, there's a decline. He says that there is a declining birth rate in the United States or in the world. And he said... That could be a thing and that a lot of abductees say that they have wanted to uh, take uh, biological material from us when they have been abducted. Well, why would they do that? Uh, they would only do that. I can't, inf I can't know why they would do that, but I can infer that they find value in our biological material. I don't know what they want to use it for. I can extrapolate upon that and say maybe there is, you know, when we see these these uh, when people have seen these gray aliens and say that they are not seeing a, a, a sex organs and so forth, maybe they are having a, a difficulty uh, because they want to hybridize, you know, have something that's part biological and partly electromechanical. And so I ask you this, Brian, can you do you think that you can create something that do you think AI or a computer can create something that feels do, what is a feeling? Well, that's a good question. I don't know. I, I, I don't know if that's a possibility or not. I think for most things that people ask me, I always say there is, if there's a will, there's a way, there is a possibility to possibly do that. AI has come a long way in a very short amount of time. And some people theorize that it may even take over the world eventually. So maybe in some distant time from now that is a possibility that ai could have feelings quote unquote let's keep going with that theory let's what if it can take over the world but it doesn't feel because we don't know we can't even describe it like for example let's say that a, a future intelligence a, first of all who's your favorite musical artist god that's tough i would say who's a favorite any favorite i'll keep it simple i'll say steve miller Steve okay. Miller oh man, great band. Take the money and run. So, uh, <laughs> all right. So let's say that an, an intelligence created this hybrid, uh, this, th this, uh, let's say it's not, it's not hybridized. Let's say that it is an AI driven, um, and some like Terry Lovelace, the former air force and former assistant U S attorney for, uh, Samoa. And I think New Hampshire, he was assistant U S attorney in two locations. When he retired from being an assistant U.S. attorney, he told about his UFO adoption with another airman, right? So he says, I saw this gray alien aboard the ship, and I, it was not a sentient being. It was moving about with purpose. It was not sentient. So let's say they program that to go to Steve Miller with you, and they program it. Because when you go to see Steve Miller, when you go see any performance of art, whether it's a visual art, whether it's something, you know, you're seeing a live performance, you're seeing television, a movie, or you're, you're watching and listening to a musical performance. The purpose of art, as I see it, just me, DJ, is to move emotion. That's why you go to something. You want to be moved emotionally. And you've been to a concert, you know that that happens. Tears flow at concerts, okay? 
So if this gray alien were programmed to go to this concert with you, Brian, it they could they could tell it to move like this. They could tell it to sort of dance around. But can it feel what you feel without oh, biology? A, yeah, I would say absolutely not. Not without biology. No, that's that's what I, that's what I'm getting at. So that's why I think that they want uh that uh, some of these intelligences, because I don't want to blanket and say all it's, you know, you just can't do that. I, I can't even ascribe an in, intent because I don't know how many intelligences have visited us or are already here. And they just reveal themselves when they want us to see them. Something that you'll hear your colleague Wes say, when people talk about intelligences and aliens every time without fail, he says, that's terrifying. It's not terrifying to me, but it is terrifying to a lot of Americans or, or people. It doesn't even matter if they're from America, depending on what your worldview is. Because if you think you know everything in your world and that we're in control, this is one of the reasons that people ascribe these UFO technologies to human. If I know it's human, I can deal with it, man. I'm good because I have confidence in my humans, the United States, to be able to deal with that human-created tech threat. If I don't know what the hell it is, I'm going to buy toilet paper and hand gel. That's what happened during COVID. That's I mean, exactly not me, right. Right? Not me, DJ, because I don't care if I don't know. I'm not worried about what these other intelligence are going to do. They're going to do what they're going to do. I'm not going to change their intent. Well, let's talk a little bit about, we've mentioned it a couple of times. Let's talk about Bigfoot, right? Because we, you and I were talking a little bit before we went on the air about some interesting conversations I've had with people recently about Bigfoot from around the world. So let's talk a little bit about what got you interested in Bigfoot in the first place. And then we'll, we'll kind of go into some of your theories on, on the big hairy giant that may be walking around in North America. I have to credit my co-creator of Calling All Beings. His name is Nathan. He is known as at a waif soul, A-W-A-I-F-S-O-U-L. He is one of the most amazing human beings I've met in my life, and I'm very thankful that he came into my life at 54 years old or whatever the hell it was when we started this jam and what a ride it is. So um, I made a lifelong friend, and we've met in person a couple of times. So he forwarded me an episode of Sasquatch Chronicles. And I was absolutely blown away because I didn't know that this existed. I was like all these other Americans out there and humans for that matter, who thought that, oh, there's just this one uh, relic that was left over in California and there may be a couple of them running around. I had no idea about the amount of BFO reports, uh, BFRO reports and 49 states reporting and so when that happened, I dove into Bigfoot like headlong. I mean, my show, I'm sure all these, I, I've had on probably 10 Bigfoot guests since then, if not more, and we're going to have more on the way, including you. And, um, and, and, and that was it. I'm sure my, my show thought that they totally lost me to Bigfoot and they haven't because I think it's, a, you know, we have paranormal guests coming on. I'm very excited about that. Uh, and, I, you can talk to me about anything Bigfoot because I promise you I have done – I've been out in the field uh, three times and uh, only – I haven't heard anything or seen anything. I heard a couple of houses about it, and it was not close to camp, but I just love the topic, so I'll go anywhere you want to go with Bigfoot. Well, let's, let's go with what's been sticking in my crawl over the last five or six months is – why we aren't farther down the field when it comes to Bigfoot research. You know, I've had conversations recently with Cliff Barackman, and I was talking about this with Cliff, and, you know, he argued a little bit and said, well, kind of like Les Stroud did when I had Les on the show. What more do you want? There's plenty of evidence out there. Mm -hmm. But for me, without a body or a definitive way to say this is a species that we don't know anything about, it's an undocumented species, and we're going to start this – scientific journey into seeing what these things are. Are they Homo florensiensis? Are they Denisovans? Are they some sort of something left over from maybe Gigantopithecus, some people think. Mm -hmm. Cliff thinks they're more Paranthropus and some, some of these theories that people throw out there about what these things are. And I tell you, I get a lot of stuff. I get a lot of evidence from people all the time. People send me videos and pictures and they tell me their anecdotal stories. 
And we're still no closer, in my opinion, to saying definitively, at least I'm not, I'm 50, 50 on Bigfoot. And people say, well, you do a Bigfoot show, you know? Yes. 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 Brian. <laughs> but I'm 50%, <laughs> right? And I've had experiences of my own that I can't explain. I've heard things on my property that have scared the shit out of me <laughs> that I can almost in my brain attribute to Bigfoot. Right. Right. But I'm just not there. So you looking into the subject, you hear these anecdotal stories, you know, what do you think about why we aren't further down the road? If these things exist, why haven't we proven that they are real at this point in 2023? And after after we we discuss this, let's get to cognitive dissonance because I think we need to go there. So I, you and I personally need to have this conversation. So I think we're not down the road further is because um, there's a couple of reasons. For one thing, the Bigfoot community does not have a Lou Elizondo and a Christopher Mellon and then a Dave Fravor and an Alex Dietrich and the, these last names, and a Chad Underwood and uh, Ryan Graves, the other fighter pilot who saw the East Coast, right, off the coast of Jacksonville and then off the coast of Virginia Beach, who saw the Cuban sphere thing. I mean, imagine how your mind would be blown, Brian. You're out there flying your aircraft, and you see a cube within a sphere. I mean, right? You're like, his face is like, what do you do with that? It's clear. I, I don't even know what to do with that. So, I mean, obviously, we haven't found a body in the, I mean, to me, I, I think, I suppose, I hypothesize that it's because they are, so, they have so much intelligence that we have that while they can't perform microsurgery in a hospital setting and they can't create um, an acid blocker for your stomach, they can be a master of the woods and knowing how to survive and to stay hidden when they want to. So when people say, well, like when Renee would say, hey, if this thing was so hidden, how come it? Because it had another agenda in mind. And we don't, I can't presume to know what each individual Bigfoot, the malevolent ones, the benevolent ones, the different personalities like humans are, how could we pretend to know what they, what their intention was in that moment where they saw a human? How could we know that? Yes, maybe it did want to show himself to get you away from its family. Uh, any number. Maybe it was curious. Maybe they're bored. Uh, like Vic Cundiff likes to say all the time, you know, it's pretty boring out there in the woods, you know, coming up to somebody's house and having a look in the window, you know, entertainment, maybe. I don't know. So I suppose that's it. I think one of the questions that I had with, uh, I have a, a, a chat with about 15 U UK UFO friends. And, and Nathan and Deb, uh, another couple of my co-hosts and myself. And I said to them, you know, should I go on this campaign and contact a legislator? Uh, name, his name is uh, Tim Burchett. He's from Tennessee. He's Dan Warren's legislator. And he's been very helpful on UFOs. Should I contact him about Bigfoot disclosure? Can we, can we move this ball forward on Bigfoot disclosure? And then maybe get to answers that we suspect the government has. And you and I can get into conspiracies and I can explain to you how very easily they can keep secrets because we'll talk about sensitive compartmentalized information. But before we get there, is this a good idea? I sent a, another message to them about 60 seconds later saying, maybe this is not a good idea. Maybe Bigfoot does not need disclosure other than the safety issue of scaring the living hell out of campers and hikers and hunters that don't know that they exist. Maybe the best bet for Bigfoot is to have no more disclosure than I have right now. Because all that's going to do is create more of these groups, and I'm not going to name them, but you know who they are, that are out there literally hunting for one of these and have spent years and haven't bagged one yet. Dave Politis suspects that they won't. What do you think about that? I have my own personal opinions about that. I know at least a couple of people that are in groups, the NWACP, the North America, yeah, NAW, yeah, North American Wood Ape Conservancy is one of those groups. And I know people in that group that I've had on the show. And I've asked that question 
you, they've been out in Area X for decades, and they've had sightings, and they've had they've taken shots at these things. Dave Collier is one of those people that comes to mind that has taken a couple of shots at these things over the years, and it did hit something at one point, and was very upset about it. He's still tears him up because they never found what he hit. The last thing you want to do as a hunter or somebody in that situation is wound an animal and then not be able to recover it. But yeah, so I have my own thoughts about that. I, I personally like what the North American Wood Ape Conservancy is doing because I think that's what it's going to take to scientifically prove that these animals exist. If that is one of the things that you're setting out to do is, is prove and have discovery. So to, to what end? Well, it, that depends on who you ask, I guess. So right. there are so people. What, what's it going to do for it? Well, <laughs> I know be... <laughs> for the North American Wood Ape Conservancy, for example, they are all about conserving the animals that are left. So in order to do that, their opinion is they have to take a specimen for it to be scientifically recognized and officially deemed a species. And then they can conserve the remainder because I do believe in some cases there may be some encroachment and things that might would stop if there is a conservancy effort. Now, I too, like you believe, I'm, I'm on the fence there as well. I think you should just leave them the hell alone personally. <laughs> That's the thing. They're, They're protecting themselves right. just They're fine, fine without. <laughs> right. So they don't need us. They, they, they don't need us and they don't need they don't need their existence proven. And if you want to go out and have an interaction with one, we have thousands of people who have done that and know how to do that if they want to do that. Uh, and if you don't, you cannot have, in some cases, an encounter. But to say that I'm going to go out there and do this to, to prove that it exists, and then what? I mean, it's already, they know that it, the government knows it's there. <laughs> you think they don't know? Of course they know that it's there. Of I have my opinions. Don't. I have my opinions on that as well. I, I was telling you before we went on the air, I was talking to Pete Bridal over in, he's actually in Eastern Bavaria, but he's originally from Australia and he had some really interesting encounters down in the Solomon Islands. And that'll be a very interesting episode for you guys to tune in for later. But mm -hmm. one of the things he and I were talking about after the interview was over is he asked me about, do, do I believe there's a government conspiracy? Do I believe that they know about Bigfoot? And I've said that before openly on the show. I worked in government. It was a small, in, in the big scheme of things, it wasn't the federal government, right? I did work for the federal government at some point in time, but I was a city of Atlanta police officer. And I saw the dysfunction in the, albeit it's a fairly large city, there was a lot of dysfunction. The left hand never knew what the right hand was doing. And to think that on some global scale, at least let's talk just in here in America, that the federal government has all these people that are tasked with keeping the Bigfoot secret a secret. I'm not sure there's a day or there, to be honest. I think it's more localized. I think there is some things that probably get covered up. I've had people on the show that talked about rangers covering up footprints, literally physically removing footprints that people reported before they could be photographed and other things because they feel like they're protecting what's going on in the park system. They don't want Bigfoot to be known because they don't want the missing 411 to be on everybody's mind. They want them to go out and enjoy Yellowstone and hike without the fear of being killed by a Sasquatch. So do I think some level of that may be going on? Sure. But I don't think there's a global vast conspiracy theory well, or conspiracy to, to suppress that information, in my opinion. Well, let's talk about that because I did, I have worked been for the in the, involved in the federal government for the last 30 years and did have a TSSCI clearance. I don't have one now because my job doesn't require that I have one right now. So they don't renew your clearance unless you are in a position that requires you get reinvestigated. So let's talk about this. Sensitive compartmentalized information is SCI. And one of the most important requirements to be read into that. And I actually heard George Knapp and Jeremy Corbell say this incorrectly the other day. They said, oh, I knew a guy that was in the nuclear agency and he had information about UFOs. And they said he could walk into any pro, get read in on any program he want. No, actually you can't. And you get read in on the programs that you have a need to know. And if you don't have a need to know and you're not the sec def, you know, or in some cases, even the president, there are presidents, uh, I've been told by IC officials, 
that there's certain information that Eisenhower had and there's certain information that George H.W. Uh, Bush had because he was director of the CIA prior to taking over his POTUS uh, that other presidents have not been read in on. And you heard President Clinton say that, that he tried to find out about UFOs and he was not read in. Uh, you've uh, President Obama was fairly coy about it. And obviously for President Trump, it bear for no part of anything that he was interested in at all. So, uh, so, so there you have that, right? So absolutely, I'm, I don't talk about global worldwide. I believe in sovereignty. And every government, like I talk about in UFOs, every government talks about UFOs or doesn't because they see it in their interest not to. Does Spain probably have a program? Yes. Does the UK have a program that we have no information, they have no legislation on? Yes. Does Russia have a program? Yes. Uh, do the Brazilians have a program? Yes. And we could keep going on down the line to, to uh, nations like Germany and uh, Poland that we don't have a relationship where we're giving any significant aid like we may have been given to the Brazilians in the early 90s when they had the, the major UFO situation in 94. Okay, you could ascribe some of that to, hey, if you want your aid package, we want that body, you know. Okay, that could have happened. I don't know that, right? But I want to be fair. There are many countries out there, including the Five Eyes country, Canada, New Zealand, United Kingdom, Australia, United States, right? You have your Five Eyes um, that have their own reasons why they don't want to talk about UFOs and why uh, that guy, Victor, who was just on with, uh, I don't know if he was on with you or Vic Cundiff or which one of these shows, and he got his ass chased out of Australia by both the police and the Rangers after he had an encounter 30 miles from the trailhead with a Yowie, okay? I don't know why they don't want to talk about it, but if you're asking me, can the U.S. government have actual knowledge and have had a body and have dissected it? Absolutely, and you would not know about it, just like you have not one idea what's going on at Area 51 other than what you've heard of through people like Bob Lazar that is filtered down through journalists like George Knapp and Jeremy Corbell and others. But Bigfoot does not have that fanfare that UFO has, the UFOs have. So if the Department of Interior said, you know, your basic marching orders are this, then people are going to comply with that. Do Are all of those rangers read into TSSCI in every state? No. They're following what they've been told. Were those rangers in Apalachicola that said they found a burnt one up and then a government official approached them and said, if you like your pension, you won't talk about this. Yeah, I, I believe that happened. And I believe that's happened a number of times. That's not a grand conspiracy. That is the owner of that information, which may be the Office of Primary Responsibility on this, is obviously the Department of the Interior. This is not a DOD issue, even if there's an occurrence on DOD property like Fort Lewis. It's probably the OPR is probably the Department of Interior. And do they have an interest? What people have to understand is if you want the, 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 the federal government, any federal government, whether it's in the UK or elsewhere or here, to if you want them to move on something, you have to make them move off of their position. Does it benefit the U.S. government to tell Brian and DJ that there are things operating in our air that they cannot control or identify? Does that benefit the government, Brian? Absolutely not. Exactly. So the only way you get them to talk about it is you have to have someone with a cape on, like Lou Elizondo and like a Christopher Mellon. I mean, Lou Elizondo resigned from a GS-15 position in the Pentagon. You know what kind of money that, that would have been? what he's missing in retirement right now. I tell people he's a, you Twitter meatheads, he's a hero. You should be, and, and not say that you should bow down to anybody's feet, but for you to question his motives, he went home and told his wife, and we spoke with his wife off air. He had to go home and say, I'm quitting the Pentagon because they won't let me brief General Mattis about UFOs. And then Christopher Mellon went and got them on the Hill. The Bigfoot community does not have this representation. And that is why it is not a national issue. And by the way, big, as I said before, Bigfoot, Bigfoots writ large are probably better off because the more fanfare they get, you are going to see more hunting groups in every state saying like these idiots who go over to Africa and shoot a lion just to bring home the, the skin or shoot some sort of 
uh, uh, animal and just to, you know, be able to pose that will happen with Bigfoot. And I don't think that helps Bigfoot. I'm sorry. And I want to say one more thing. If anybody is okay in the interest of science, and by the way, saying I documented Bigfoot, yay, hooray me. Okay. Are you okay if a UFO lands on Brian's property tonight and takes his daughter because it's in the interest of their science. Well, that's okay. I mean, you could understand that. That's reasonable. Right? Everybody should. It's the same exact thing as saying, I am going to blast one of these little Bigfoot kids, grab it by the hair, and drag its ass back to the truck and take it in and be the hero. It's okay, though, because it's for science. I see your point here, DJ. This seems like something we're going to have to continue. This is yeah, another one of those discussions we're going to have to talk about on your show, maybe. So <laughs> we've mentioned it a couple of times. Let's talk about your show, Calling All Beings. Let's talk about what people can expect when they tune in and where do they find it. Okay, so Calling All Beings, we're on all the major platforms, uh, including the one that Brian's on, which is Spreaker, how he uh, brings uh, this show to you. We're on YouTube. It is, um, you know, just if you search calling all beings on YouTube, you'll probably see my fat head pop up. Actually, I'm not that fat. Um, and uh, we have a great cast of characters, Nathan, Deb. Uh, we have Leah Prime, who's just come on, who's absolutely amazing. Frank is a brilliant intellect for when we do a UK show or do a weekend show. We get Frank. And we also have drugged Matt Knapp, our Bigfoot correspondent, <laughs> is now a cabbie. So uh, and just a, a wonderful person as well. And and for someone who's got 20 years of uh, field research, Brian, he's very open minded. I got to give him that, man. That is really that's a that's a that's a great thing because you can become very jaded when you spend a lot of years uh, researching anything. So the, the thing is, is, uh, you know, people just please, you know, keep an open mind about what's out there. We don't we don't know it all. Uh, we haven't figured it all out. And you know, don't be afraid to not know because there's a difference between being skeptical, which we all need to be. Brian made his entire career on being able to interview people, be the skeptic, and then figure out who was telling the truth and what was real. But there's a there's a gulf between skeptic skepticism, debunkerism, which I won't go into who, who those folks are, and cognitive dissonance is that I see it, I don't want to believe it. I don't want to believe it. I think we got to allow for, for, for that is that it's okay. You know, it's not saying you have to believe every story you hear. I have experiencers that have told me things and I don't believe them either, just like you have. And I have some that I do believe. Well, there you have it, folks. I will link to the show in the show notes. You guys go over and check out DJ and all the guys and gals over at Calling All Beings. Man, I really appreciate you coming on. I've had a blast and I can't wait to continue the conversation. It was an honor speaking with you, Brian. I really did not expect this. I just was like going to have a phone conversation with you, but it's an honor to be on your show and, and, and we'll have you on ours as well. Thank you. They say